his daughter should not choose medicine as her career. And so um, I particularly enjoyed home economics in high school, and I decided I would major in uh, home economics. And so in 1943, when I entered the University of Arkansas, I chose uh, home economics as my major, and I had chemistry and biology as my minor subjects. Very good. Well, tell us a little about campus life. Did you live on campus? I did. I, okay. I lived in Cornell Hall, which okay. recently they've turned into um, um, a dining facility and uh, uh, a hotel. And it's on campus, and I've been up there several times to eat. They have a very fine restaurant. Well, good. And uh, so I've been up there several times. That's kind of nice. A little nostalgia, right? It is. Yes, that's right. That's really cool. <laughs> um, very much. The stairwells are still there that I walked up and down when uh, I was a student. That is really nice. Yeah. What about any, um, uh, were you in any student clubs at all when you were in college? Or? No, I don't remember very okay. much about that. Okay. Um, was there, a, no, there probably was a home ec club though, probably, don't you think? Yes, I'm sure, sure. I belong. Right. Okay. Then uh, after you, and you graduated in what, you got your bachelor's in 1947? Yes. Uh -huh. And then what, uh, then, then what did you do? Did you go on to grad school? Well, I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, at the university, though, Dr. Grace Henderson was the dean of, of my college, uh, home economics at Arkansas. Uh -huh. And um, she was, encouraged me in many things, and she always notified me if there was anything that might interest me. Like, uh, she told me that the uh, University of Arkansas had an arrangement with the Merrill Palmer School of Child Development in Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. My junior year, I could apply for that and be a semester off campus with credits at the University of Arkansas. And so I, I applied and I did go, and that was a really good experience for someone who hadn't been around too much. Sure. And, uh, so, um, and I'm going to mention her again. Also, she told me about the Danforth Summer Camp, which is also the junior year. And we went to uh, when Mr. Danforth was still alive. And I went to his camp, I think it's called Camp Manawaka in Michigan. And uh, that was a very fine experience. They had um, students from many universities over the U.S. And, uh, so, but anyway, I want to, later on in, in this uh, discussion, I want to go back to Dean Henderson be, after she moved to Penn State. Okay. She's the one who was at Arkansas, correct? Yes. Okay. All righty. Go ahead. Um, I'll just let's leave it up to you because after anything else that you'd like to reflect on in college and then what came next, I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, I think I'll go on to, you know, uh, now that I'm in my 80s, I've forgotten a lot of my... Oh no, it's coming. I'm I back know. here now. I have been up several times to the University of Arkansas. I bet it's grown a lot since you were there. It has. Oh Lord, like like Purdue, right? Yes. Right. Okay, doke. Um, how how far from uh, uh, where you're living now? Where is the university? Is it is it not very far? Yeah, I've not been to Arkansas, so I don't know. Yeah, we have a branch of the university here at, in Fort Smith. Okay. Well, Fort Smith, uh, U of A. Sure. Uh, the university is about 50 miles. It's about a one-hour drive. Oh, that's not like from here to Indianapolis. Yeah. Right. Okay. All righty. Go ahead then. I'll take. Um, what came next after you got your degree? Okay. I uh, taught home economics at Harrison High School, and that's in northwest Arkansas, and that's about two-hour drive from uh, where I uh, lived in Mulberry, and. Um, but after two years there, I was ready to move on from teaching in high school to get more education. And so then I chose to begin graduate study. This was in 1949. And um, uh, I selected the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And that was on the advice of the state supervisor of home economics. And I majored in education there and finished in 1950 and um, that's pretty good you just took about a year to finish that's pretty good yes and uh, at this point uh, actually I was recruited I've never applied for a job I used to been recruited I was recruited uh, from uh, our 
Arkansas Tech University. In fact, while I was there, they uh, came up by plane to uh, uh, discuss this with me, and uh, they appointed me associate professor of home economics at uh, Arkansas Tech, which is in Russellville. Wonderful. Hey, that's just great. You're moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> but after five years at Arkansas Tech, I was ready to move on <laughs> to, to more okay. education. Okay, sounds and good. And this is my path cross with the, Dean Grace Henderson. She had moved from Arkansas to um, be a dean. Uh, I think it was called Home Economics at the time. Uh-huh. Janelle, but she um, was at Penn State University, and she found out I was interested in moving, and so she started encouraging me to enroll at Penn State. So in 1957, I enrolled as a graduate student at Penn State in nutrition science, and I had a minor in biochemistry, and I uh, met several of the professors, but the one that I wanted to work with was Dr. Ruth Pike, and she is a professor of nutrition science, and she did become my graduate student advisor and my major professor, and her area of research was in vitamin B6, so that's where I got my start in, in vitamin B6, working with her, and she had a she worked with uh, rats, and my family just couldn't believe that I was working with rats. But anyway, uh, she was an excellent research person, and she had a good laboratory and a good rat laboratory. And I was very happy at Penn State, and I discovered that I love nutrition research. So, um, And you like that area as well? I did. Sure. Pennsylvania is beautiful. I'll never forget when I, before I drove to uh, the first time I went uh, to uh, Penn State, and I just couldn't believe how beautiful it was as I approached the campus. Mm -hmm. It's just a beautiful place. It's so anyway, I earned my PhD degree at Penn State in 1960. Uh-huh. And uh, at that time, Universities were searching for faculty with PhD degrees in nutrition. So I had a wide range of choices. And one was University of Maryland where they wanted to become his department head. And my major professor, Dr. Pike, she said, no, you don't start there. You go someplace and you do some research. And uh, <laughs> she seemed like she knew what she was talking about. So I, at that time also, I'd had a call from Purdue. And so, um, I uh, interviewed at Purdue, and it was easy for me to select Purdue because I particularly was impressed with Dr. Gladys Vail. She was the department head, and I liked her immediately. She was honest, and she had a love of science. And uh, also, the facilities at Purdue were very excellent. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Vail showed me a research laboratory that would be mine if I decided to come to Purdue. and. Um, so uh, anyway, <laughs> I did decide to come to Purdue, and I was there for 35 years. I know that's wonderful. And what was your impression when you did you come um, when you first came? You've probably not been around this area before, had you? I hadn't. Yeah. Okay. And but I came on a train, which is kind of unusual now. You know, you fly, but I know. anyway, I, I came on the James Whitcomb Rally train. I remember it well. And when we got to the depot, I saw a person that I knew was Gladys Vale. I had never seen her before. Oh, she Very, met you? That's great. She yeah. She was trying to meet me. So uh, I enjoyed her all of her life. She was a wonderful person. Right, yeah. And then she ultimately became the dean of the school. Yes, she did. Sure. She did. Uh-huh. Okay, well, let's tell us about tell us a little about the early days and uh, your research focus, and then I got to we'll move on from there. Go ahead. So you okay. got started. You had your lab. Yeah, and I'm going to begin with my success. Good. Uh, at Purdue is so it's associated with the graduate students. I had 61 graduate students, and um, uh, I had a, a full time technician. Uh, thanks to Dean Vale, 
and that was Isabel Miller, and she worked with me for many, many years. She only took off to begin her family. She had two boys. Uh huh. I remember and, uh, Isabel because I've met her several times. You yeah, know, sure. In Scotland, and she's a wonderful person and was a wonderful technician for me for many, many years. And uh, I was very fortunate to have her and to have the graduate students that I had. I had 25 um, uh, students that got PhD degrees in my, under me and um, 35 Master of Science. Very good. Very and many, 12 of those were international students, most of them PhDs, and they've gone back to their countries to India, Taiwan, Korea, Egypt, Iran. Those are the countries where uh, I have former students. Mm -hmm. And uh, my students at the university uh, uh, have, uh, well, three of them uh, took positions at Purdue. And two of those, and that, that was Dr. Moray, Dr. Hamaker, and, and uh, Karen Jameson. Um, Moray and Jameson have retired, but Hamaker is still there. He's in food science, and he's having a very distinguished career. Mm -hmm. And some of my students are at uh, Nebraska, Texas, Auburn, University of California at Berkeley. So, uh, and some of them are in uh, laboratories, Abbott and Ross laboratories. I have two at Abbott and two at Ross Lab. And some of my students went to Washington, D.C. with the Nutrition Foundation, mm -hmm. where they do writing, mostly writing. Okay, very. It's nice that, that you're able, you can ca capture where they where they went on after they left you and what oh, they've yeah. done. I've kept up with, you know, with not sure. all of them, but a lot of them. That's right, that's good. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, your, your research with the B6? And I thought then I was going to ask you a little bit about the projects, particularly starting with the um, that nutrition collaborative research support program that you were, ran for so long. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, actually, that program really helped me. And I, I uh, you know, worked with vitamin B6 for many years, and, uh, and my students worked in that area. And I had always, vitamin B6, a deficiency in an infant causes convulsions. So I had students that uh, worked with rats and they did where you could, you know, get a deficiency and see what happens to the brain. So they started with rats that were pregnant and followed them through pregnancy and uh, lactation in, in uh, early life. and. Um, out of that, we found that um, vitamin B6 deficiency re does result in convulsive seizures right at birth, and some of the young die. And so it had never been discovered uh, exactly what had happened in the brain. So I had several students that studied, uh, worked with uh, Dr. Doss in, uh, in the department in biology and uh, he did electron microscopy. And so my students uh, did that and found some drastic changes in the brain of uh, developing rats that, whose mothers had been deficient in vitamin B6. And uh, uh, I had an opportunity, I always wanted to study human subjects and I had one student uh, who was interested in uh, working with humans and so we worked with the women in, uh, in uh, West Lafayette, and a lot of the work was through Dr. Hahnemann, a okay. pediatrician. Sure, okay. And uh, he was able to get us subjects, and uh, we'd get it uh, approved through the Human Subjects Committee. And so um, we had, uh, it was not possible, of course, to do too much with uh, with the infants except that the, we uh, got blood samples and then we uh, got samples from the mother. And the mothers that took supplements had much higher levels in their milk and, and of course the babies also had in their blood. So we worked for many years trying to find out what was a adequate level and I don't know if we ever reached that or not, but one thing that I did find uh, with that uh, Egypt project uh, was that uh, 
the mothers over there had very low levels of vitamin B6 in their milk. And uh, Ted Wax in psychology was uh, uh, on the team of people that were working on this project in Egypt. And he was doing behavior studies. It's called the APGAR score. At three days of age, the infants are given this score. And some of the work that came out of that showed that uh, when they were given the APGAR score, one of the uh, parts of the APGAR score is to uh, use various stimuli. And uh, one of them was ringing the bell. And when uh, the person who was administering the test would ring the bell, uh, the infants that were lowest in vitamin B6 would just get out of control. I mean, you know, they would cry and and mm -hmm. uh, they were hard to, but where an infant of a mother who had adequate B6, I mean, you know, they would maybe jump a little when the bell, but they never cried or got out of control. Sure, they sort of heard the sound and it sort of shook them a little bit, you know. Yeah. Like a whip, drug, you know, I see. Huh. But the ones that were low in B6 just got out of control. So that was one of the interesting things that, that uh, we found. And then, um, let's see, it seems like there was something. Oh, I know. I have a graduate student who worked with, uh, uh, with some of the data uh, from Egypt on uh, vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 wasn't part of that uh, study, and I had to get uh, another grant in order to do it. I could piggyback on some of the findings, but I, to do the parts of evaluating this B6 status, I had to get another grant. Okay. And I, I, uh, the Thasher Fash, Foundation in uh, Utah uh, gave me support to do that study. And uh, I think we found, it, we found some very interesting things. And uh, uh, we just studied the infants for six months. Uh, and most of the tests uh, were done by Dr. Wax. And we put that data with what we found in B6. And I think that was, uh, you know, uh, the closest I got to uh, illustrating the effects of low vitamin B6 in, particularly in early development in pregnancy and in the first six months. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That project was really um, quite an extensive one, wasn't it, time-wise as well, the oh, Egypt, it was, Egypt? It was a huge project. It involved six. U.S. universities, it was Berkeley and UCLA in California and um, Arizona and Connecticut and Kansas and Purdue. And at Purdue, we collab we combined with Kansas and Arizona and uh, worked together on our part of the project, which was in Egypt. And Connecticut worked in Mexico and and uh, the California universities uh, worked in Kenya. Okay, okay. Oh. Well, we had a three-country project with six universities <laughs> participating. Wow, that's a that was a big undertaking. Yes, and they selected me to be the facilitator, <laughs> so it was a job. I bet, I bet. As you look back on it, you say, wow. <laughs> How did we do it? There you go, but we did, you know. <laughs> um, what about any, uh, did you want to make uh, any uh, comment about the uh, that facilitator for the Indonesia project that World Bank funded for you? That oh, was on your, your that Vita? That was a very interesting thing, and it came at the same time I was working. In, in the Egypt one? The Egypt project, but, um, and Dr. Uh, Bernie Liska was also uh, the other person working in uh, Indonesia. Uh -huh. What we were trying to do was to, um, uh, develop nutrition graduate and research programs in two universities. One is Bogar and the other was Gajamata. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, we sent uh, some of our faculty, we used our faculty to go. I know uh, April Mason uh, went uh, for nutrition because she had worked in ex extension programs and uh, had a lot to offer. So that was five years that we uh, worked trying to help them develop graduate programs and research programs. I think we got them off to a good start. 
I haven't been back and I haven't heard, uh, you know, what's going on now. But before we left, we knew that they were going to go forward with their programs. Good. Well, that, that, you know, that's very good. Uh, one thing, person I was going to ask you about was one of your co what, a colleague with Helen Clark. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, of, course, of course, she's since passed away, but I thought you'd make a comment. It would be nice for the researchers because you, you worked, uh, you knew each other quite well. Yes. In fact, our laboratories were adjacent. Okay. And uh, she was a dear friend, and she was always champion the rights of women. She started way back when we would go to, uh, every year we'd go to uh, meet with a group of scientists, which is called a Federation of American Scientists. Sure. And, uh, you know, there were mostly men there, so it gave her a chance to, and uh, not using women who were uh, capable of doing, you know, certain things. Uh huh and um, the editors and so forth, they always would be selecting women. So she really did a lot to improve status of women in science. Sure, right. She was kind of a, I used to see her around campus, she always walked very fast. Oh, yeah, she did everything <laughs> fast. That's right, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, she did. Yeah. <laughs> um, any, uh, anything else on your research that uh, you'd like to uh, mention about it? Anything particulars? Well, uh, that we have that I didn't think to ask. Yeah, I I could uh, talk a little bit more about the Egypt project. Good. We were studying marginal malnutrition, um, or, or just really just mild, moderate, and uh, uh, it was important to study that because a lot of agencies that are helping developing countries. Um, you know, they're working with ones where people are starving. And I mean, that's important, very important. But um, they we seem to be overlooking um, some of the countries that we were working in, like Mexico and Egypt and Kenya, uh, people that were just marginally malnourished. So, um, and this was an idea of, um, of Doris Calloway. At, she was at UC Berkeley. She's, all, she's deceased now, but uh, she was uh, really the instigator of this project. And it was with the USAID, U.S. Agency for International Development, uh -huh. and, uh, and these six universities that I mentioned previously were involved. And um, anyway, uh, we did find some significant effects, negative effects, of... Uh, because we were studying families. It was a very complicated project. We were studying the mother and father and a pregnant mother and um, a school-age child and a, uh, a toddler. A toddler and a young, young child. We had five members of the family that we were studying, and uh, <laughs> it was a very difficult study, uh, but I think uh, we have data to show, because we were working with many disciplines, and of course, uh, uh, psychology, and it was economics, and we had physicians, um, uh, Dr. Ishmael uh, uh, was uh, involved in this, in uh, doing the uh, uh, metabolic studies mm -hmm. and uh, of course he was into exercise and so forth right. but also he was an Egyptian so he was very helpful mm -hmm. a project and uh, I think uh, the we have volumes of data and many many reports on this project I bet I think we did show that uh, you've got to be careful with uh, with mild, moderate nutrition, and that's what we were studying in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I hope it was worth all the millions. The we had got fourteen million dollars uh, for the for a five-year project. It took it took us seven, 
And then after that, we hadn't had time to do data analysis like we wanted to, so we applied for three million additional funding uh, to do statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. And George McCabe in the statistics department was, who's an excellent statistician, helped us immensely with that part of the project. So, um, and you know, uh, it was just a year or two after that that, uh, well, uh, those projects ran until 92 and I retired in 95 and I was still working on data from the Egypt project. <laughs> That's right. Did you, did you spend a lot, you had to spend a lot of time over there as well? I did. Did you? Okay. But I was still, um, you know, involved in. The oh sure, but you, but you, we were on site too as well. Yes, uh, I spent. We had to. Uh, the government required that we spend at least the U.S. AID uh, required that we spend at least two months when we went over there. So, and I think I had ten trips. So, all together, um, you know, I spent twenty months. In Egypt. <laughs> oh, wow, that's quite a that's quite a spell there, you yeah. know, back and forth. <laughs> yeah. um, you wanted to um, let me ask: Were you a, fac a faculty fellow at any of the uh, residence halls at all when you were here? No, I wasn't. Okay, okay. Uh, how about uh, department heads? You talked about Dr. Vale, but uh, there were a couple of others. Any comments you'd like to make on some of your department heads there? Dr. Abernathy is the name that comes to mind. Oh, yeah. And uh, Mary Fuqua was another one. Yes. Well, they both were very good. Sure. Uh, I just, uh, Gladys Vail was just my first one, and she gave sure. me, a, I, I just, I, you know, she just really was helpful to me in um, providing me with a nice laboratory, and she even provided me my technician for a while until I got started. She, I think she really knew what it was like. Uh, well, I know she did because she was a uh, scientist. To um, to get started, you need some help. But you know, she would ask me about every other day. I'd meet her in the halls, and she'd say, "And I had just I came in January uh, of '61, I believe it was, to Purdue, and every time I met her in the hallway, she'd say, "Now, are you working on uh, a lifetime research project?" <laughs> She had big goals for you, right? <laughs> I, I was teaching two classes, and I was new, and I, was, I thought, oh, my, I'm so busy with my classes, I don't know. <laughs> One no. evening, I uh, was reading a nutrition journal, and I saw that they uh, were offering uh, uh, $25,000 research projects, you know, and you just send in a, a proposal. So I didn't know what the rules were, so I, you know, immediately wrote a proposal. And in a few weeks, which is unusual, I got uh, a note saying they had accepted my proposal and where should they send the $25,000? Well, I didn't know that you had to go through Purdue Research Foundation <laughs> and you had to have your budget approved and overhead <laughs> added to it and all of that. So I went up to see uh, Gladys Vale and she said, uh, don't worry about it. She said, I'll take care of this. <laughs> so you I just, you just answered Andrew, the ad, right? <laughs> Yes, and she did. Uh, the Fred Andrews is dean of graduate school, and I think he must have also been involved in Purdue sure. Foundation. So um, I don't know if it was the first or not, but he uh, ignored the overhead because it was a small project. Sure. You know, it was twenty-five thousand wasn't very much compared to this seventeen million for Egypt project. But um, but it was a start. Okay, start. every bit helps. Yes, <laughs> it was a wonderful help, and I think that's why the Nutrition Foundation, you know, offered it. Sure. So anyway, that was my beginning of research. Yeah. <laughs> Went Where? through the several steps before you sent in a proposal. Oh, yeah, it's very good. Uh, let's turn a little bit about, do you want to talk a little bit, uh, I was going to ask you about a couple of committees you're on, particularly that um, Vision 21 committee, which was in Dr. Baring when he was the pres uh, president, correct? At Vision 21 committee? Oh, yes. Yeah, the Purdue committee. And also you were on that um, distinguished teaching professorship, that uh, a selection committee for distinguished teaching professorship? Uh -huh. what? Yes. 
what sort of committee what uh, would that help select people to be uh, selected as distinguished professors? Was that what the nature of the work was for that committee? That really is, was it. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, all righty. And then one, you know, I didn't have a lot to do with that. I was on the committee, but... Um, That's one of the awards I was going to ask about, that you got that. You're the distinguished professor, the emeritus, distinguished professor of foods and nutrition. Yes. Actually, um, uh, let's see, when did I get that? Uh, 85, I think? Yeah. And uh, uh, I don't know exactly what, you know, I think Helen Clark had a lot to do with it. She was the first distinguished woman professor, and I was the second. But now there's several on the campus. Sure. But uh, so Helen Clark really started that, and I think she was the one who probably, uh, you know, was significant in my, because she had retired uh, when I received. Uh, oh, she'd already retired? Yes. Oh, had she? Okay. Let me ask, let me ask you this, Dr. Kersey. How do you select, do they select the name for it, or do you have some input on that? No, they select it because uh, Meredith was somehow involved. Somebody this recently in the egg school called me. He was working on, his first name was Fred. I don't Fred, know. Fred Whitford, yes. Well, she was the first female member of the Board of Trustees, and he's writing a book about her, Virginia Meredith. Yes, yes, yes. All right. And um, anyway, um, that's, and I don't know who called this the Meredith, I don't know who was responsible for that. But Helen was the first one, Helen Clark. Was she the first female of all the university or just in your particular school? The university. Oh, wonderful. And, and you were the second? I was second. She saw to that that I would be second. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> so I've been really promoted all along by women that have been interested in uh, promoting other women. And you had the credentials and could move forward, move along with it. Let me ask you this one thing. One committee I noticed you were on, we were the chair of the library committee for quite a while, 1970 to 78. That's a big job. It's a long tenure. Well, I, I, uh, I was secretary, and I, all I remember <laughs> from it, somebody from the English department, I don't remember who it was, yeah. he would like fuller minutes. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things that one remembers. <laughs> uh, well, I want to talk a little, uh, switch a little again and get to some of the awards. One of the ones that you got way back in 1965 was the Future Leader Award. You were the first winner, the North American branch of the International Life Sciences Institute. Bet you don't remember that one. Well, let me see. 1965, a Future Leader Award, the first winner. North, well, I don't believe it was on your Vita, but we have a, one of the things that also that I use that is our Purdue file, which covers magazines and newspaper articles. They have to do with university personnel and activities, et cetera, and that's where I happen to see that. But you also got a, the Borden Award in 1980. That was my first one. I remember that yeah. well. Right. Uh, so that was when I knew that Dr. Clark was working on for me. Uh -huh. She had re received it earlier. And... Um, it was for my research in infant and child nutrition, and it was, it was in 1980. And uh, I have it, I, I'm in my little office that I have in my house. Mm -hmm. I have that on my wall, the Borden Award. It was a gold medallion, and then it had, you know, by, presented uh, by the Borden Company. And uh, I only have something else under it. It's in gold. I can't read it, but... I, on my wall, I, oh, I have another thing on my wall that <laughs> uh, of uh, 50 pictures of babies, and Isabel Miller is responsible for collecting that because she helped with the human studies. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a collage, they're probably about two by three pictures of 30 babies that were in my research. Sure. When people come to office, what are all those babies? <laughs> and you have it. She had that done for you? Yes. Yeah, that's very nice. He did. Yeah. And um, I also have on my board here, I, I got, I was very proud of this. I received distinguished um, alumni awards from Penn State and from the University of Arkansas at Federal. Right. Congratulations. That's, yes, that's on my list. I had that. Also, you got the, um, you got an honorary doctorate from Purdue. 
along I, with your uh, member of the Foods and Nutrition Hall of Fame. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. And uh, I have that one on my wall, too. And they took a picture. Well, I think that was when I was, uh, when I retired and I was given per the distinguished professor emeritus right. a picture with um, President Beering and John Story from our department. Sure. Very nice. Oh, um, and you're also a fellow of the American Institute of Nutrition. Yes. Oh, I was proud of that, too. Uh, yes. And I have a, I think I have a frame picture on my wall oh. about that <laughs> certificate. And one of the, the local ones that you got, too, was the, um, you're cited for the commitment to education, the salute to women for the city of, of Lafayette. Yes. That, that's very nice. Yes. And they still have that award series. It still goes on. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about was the uh, lecture series. And oh. I know you came back this year for it, didn't you? Oh, Do yeah. you try to come back almost every year? I try to. Okay. I was endowed by my students and faculty and friends and um, some of the companies like uh, uh, Gerber's, the baby food, Gerber's uh, could every year to that. Uh -huh. So um, I'm very proud of that, and, and they say it's in doubt it'll go on for, <laughs> I guess, forever. But, uh, <laughs> That's, did, it, did they start that uh, when you, uh, was that part of the uh, activities when you retired? Is that when it was started, after you retired? It was started, uh, let's see, it was just before I retired. Oh, okay, okay. It was, uh, uh, oh, 96 or something like that. And I, the one that came this year was that Barry Popkin who came and talked about uh, the world is fat, the trends, policies, and products. Yeah. You know. Sounds, yes. I'm sounded like a good talk. It was. They've had some very good people. And this year, uh, someone's coming who's worked with uh, uh, infants. In, oh, uh, wonderful. Uh, and so that should be interesting. Right. Okay. But I know her. She was active, you know, before I retired. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, uh, you've done a lot of consulting, but one of, that sort of caught my eye was you were the nutrition consultant for a, the Lower Mississippi Delta Nutrition Intervention Research Project. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. Well, it's a very poor uh, area in Arkansas, and uh, I don't think that has been active, though. I, uh, I have not really done very much with that, but it's the... It's, uh, in the Mississippi Delta region, sure. and uh, uh, it's uh, Arkansas as a whole is is poor economically, but um, that's the poorest part is in the Delta, the Mississippi Delta region, uh -huh. and uh, so that's where uh, they thought that they would be doing, you know, some work there. But I've never. Did I've, you? Did you have you have you visited? Did you go down there on a visit or in the yeah. area? Okay, I've, I've visited down there several times, but not as a part of this project. Okay, and so I really didn't do very much with that. Was when I first came back that I was put on that uh, uh, group to uh -huh. to, okay. to collect information, but I never did uh, get involved in it. Actually, what I've uh, spent my time with. It, here in Fort Smith has been with uh, literacy. I am very active. I was a tutor uh, and also um, I've been on the board uh, for uh, the literacy because we have a problem in our state with literacy and and people are so thrilled when they learn to read. Oh, I know. know. Yes, it's yes. It's a real... Uh, joy really to work with the literacy program right what age group are you working with dr kirksey are they younger children in grade school or they actually they are young adults that, oh okay you know want to be in the workforce but they if you can't read like one of them was working at a laundry and she couldn't even work there because she didn't know uh abc's or the numerals oh dear oh that's a real challenge it is right and, they are so happy, and they're so appreciative of, of what you do to help them. Right. A yeah. lot of them are, are uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, people.
people from Mexico. Okay, okay. Uh, Spanish that, speaking. Right. That have moved into the state, come there. Excuse me. Have they come to the state of Arkansas from yes. Mexico? Okay. Yes. We have a lot of diversity in Fort Smith mm -hmm. from all over the world, but we have um, many, many people uh, that come up from Mexico for better job opportunities. Sure. Right. Okay. But then they're, um, you know, they're limited because of their literacy. Right. And so um, it's a very good program to work with because they are so, so appreciative of, of your help. Right. And you can work with them one on one or whatever as a small group. Mm -hmm. Right. Also, the other thing you've been involved in your retirement is that vice president of the United Methodist Women. Are you still involved, still working, still have that position? That, yes. Okay. I've been doing quite a bit of work with the church. I did some when I was in Lafayette. I was on the uh, First United Methodist. I was on the, their board. Uh, I was on the trustees, and I was on the administrative board. But here... Um, I work with, uh, I've been involved in United Methodist Women. It's a missions group, so we uh, uh, contribute money, and then we try to have a, at least one big project where we make money that we send to missions. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's a challenge, but it's, it's, and it's a good work. You know, you enjoy doing that sort of thing. It's meaningful. It is. Right. Any other retirement activities? Uh, you did, and you just got back from a trip, though, didn't you? You told me you went to Spain. And that was just a pleasure trip. Well, that's all right. That's part of what you should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> it was really uh, nice. It was a cruise, and so we uh, went up the coast of western Italy, and we stopped at, well, we started at Malta, and uh, then we went from Malta to um, I can't remember which one we went to first. But anyway, in the course of the cruise, we ha had uh, port stops at uh, Florence and Rome and Naples. Uh, that's all I remember from yeah. that. Very nice. Good. Um, I remember all of those wonderful – have you been there? A long time ago, I was in Florence, and I, and I really – I'd love to go back to Italy sometime, but it's been a long time. I tell you, uh, in Rome, I was at too as well. Yeah, uh, the the paintings on the oh, ceilings just in those places are. We got tired our necks uh, looking at the ceiling. You could just imagine an artist spending hours <laughs> doing that. Doing that. Yeah, like Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. And they have some beautiful sculpture. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a wonderful place for art, you know, really, and it's lasted. The other thing that always impressed me, too, is these cathedrals that you visit were all built by hand. Yeah. You know, and they're still, and they're survived today. Yeah. <laughs> we, we also went to the French Riviera, and uh, it's quite a place, and uh, they still do so much. I guess they have a lot of American tourists with uh, uh what was the name? Princess Grace. Oh, in sure. In Monaco? Yeah, Monaco. Sure. Yeah. So it was uh, It was quite a trip. I, I enjoyed it. Good. Well, that was a nice change for you. Um, do you have a Purdue tradition that you uh, recall that you'd like to share with us? Any tradition of Purdue that comes to mind? Well, uh, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm sitting in a chair, a Purdue chair that was given to me. I you are a chair professor. <laughs> And sitting when, in your chair, right? When I retire, and I have a, a desk lamp. I have it turned on here uh, from Purdue. So I have, uh, and then I I have that lamp on my table that I use. Sure. And um, the chair. I'm sitting in the chair that I use at this uh, little desk. I guess it is. Right. That's nice. So, yeah. but what was the question? The uh, Purdue, do you have a Purdue tradition? Like maybe commencement or homecoming or something that uh, sticks in, re that you recall. Well, you know, I I was always struck by all of this Purdue when I first came there, and every time I had friends visit, you know, like Purdue being buried on the campus. And one day I was in uh, it's Rosemary Lottie, and her uh, office window looked out on the mall. Sure. She said, "I just can't used to 
get used to all those students working across the mall. She said, when I was a student here, it was hallowed ground, and we didn't dare walk across. <laughs> They were frying hamburgers out there, you know, during the... <laughs> the mall, oh yeah, right. I heard in the early days it was a lot different. <laughs> oh. um, what about an outstanding event? At Purdue. Oh, and just in your life, no, at, at any place. It could be anything that comes to mind. Oh, I don't know. Of course, there are a lot of them. So sure. At Purdue, I know. It was, uh, you know, getting my uh, honorary doctor of science from Purdue, that was... Special. Big, and and getting distinguished alumni at Penn State in Arkansas. Um, and Purdue has a lot of, um, of uh, traditions that I think are, you know, are very interesting. And uh, they've added so much to the campus, even since I was there. Uh -huh. You know, and the Neil Armstrong, that, all of that story. Right, right. Really interesting. Have you interviewed him? No, but we, he's given his papers to Purdue, and we're hoping sometime to be able to do an interview, but he hasn't, uh, he, he was here for the dedication, but it's difficult when people come on campus because they usually have a lot of schedules, so we're hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to do it. Yeah. But he's, he's given his papers, and also Gene Cernan has given our papers to the archives in the Florida Archive, so that's very nice. Very good. Right. Um, I think in closing, I'm going to leave it up to you. If there's something that uh, you I forgot to ask or a topic you'd like to return to, I'll leave it up to you, Dr. Kirksey. Well, you know, one thing I was going to say that okay. I was at Purdue when a lot of things, and I guess it's going on still today nationally, like uh, in the 60s, uh, we had the assassination of John F. Kennedy, right. of um, his brother Robert and Martin Luther King, and the Vietnam War was going on, and, uh, you know, the student dress was very different, and, uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> I remember some of the students telling the story of, uh, they were having some kind of, you know, when I came to Purdue in the 60s, people were still wearing, like, long formal dresses to some of the... Uh, to dances and affairs? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Yes. And uh, so there was one girl, uh, one of the uh, professors was telling me this story, that they were all concerned because this girl wasn't going because she didn't have clothes or so forth. So they were trying to help her out. And later the um, professor said she was in Indianapolis and she went by the address of this girl and she lived in... Well, one of the wealthiest areas of Indianapolis, and her father, I guess, was a, a medical person there. And uh, so, anyway, it was a time of... <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> you know, um, many times I get, what I get a kick out of, uh, I get uh, long-distance calls from students that... Uh, I haven't remembered them. I remember them because they're the ones that, uh, like, I had a call from uh, University of Washington in Seattle, and this uh, student uh, now has a doctorate, and she's on the faculty there. But uh, she was one that, when I first went to Purdue, I, I taught what was called a rat lab, and they actually got rats to work with. And I think they got four white rats to work with. And she named hers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Elvis. <laughs> and uh, I remember that story. For <laughs> are uh, you still there? Yeah, right. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but she keeps in touch with you. But this is his big year. She called me this last summer and was telling me uh, I didn't know that she'd gotten uh, her doctorate. And uh, anyway, uh, I've had several students come by. In, in Fort Smith to see me that are traveling through, you know. Well, that's very nice. It is. It's, it's, it's very nice. I like to keep up with them. I and know. then when I go back to Purdue, you know, for the lecture, sure. I always uh, find out about some of them, and some of them are there. Yeah. It's nice to keep in touch. It is. Right. I know. It means a lot. And, you know, the thing is, sometimes uh, people will see me, and it's used, you know, if it's in a group, uh, I may be one, and they remember you, but sometimes it's hard for you to remember because there's so many out, faces out in front when you're in a classroom or whatever. The lab yeah. is a little bit easier because it's smaller. Oh, there's some students, you know, that I'll never forget because of, you know, certain things. Sure, that that's right. And they, 
and you remember and you recall them. And also, I still send Christmas cards, and I keep in touch that way from people that I haven't seen in a long time. That's right. Now, <laughs> I do that, too. And uh, I had, you know, uh, one of my students is, uh, well, she worked, she's in the, at the Indiana Medical Center. Oh, she works with preterm babies, Uh huh. Carol Rickards. And uh, she's one that I keep up with, and she keeps up with me. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Any uh, any other closing things that you can think of, Dr. Kirksey? I don't know, something I missed or that you would like to uh, make a comment on? Or you think we pretty well covered it? Yeah, uh, I think we pretty well covered it, but uh, I have been all over the world as a speaker. I uh, oh, have yes. been to um, Adelaide, Australia, uh, Seoul, Korea, Kyoto, Japan, Costa Rica, and uh, to two play Hamburg, Germany, and Hanukkah. I don't know. I don't remember that one, but I have it on my list. In Mexico, of course, in Austria, Innsbruck, in Brighton, the UK, Canada, and Cairo. So I've been. I've traveled a lot in my. Uh, this is mostly in connection with the Ten and Nutrition Congress. Right. Yes, I saw the, the, one of those key ones. You were also a, a featured speaker there as well. Yeah, I re that resume was just wonderful. And uh, your list of publications, very deserving. You're more than deserving of all the accolades that you've gotten over your time. Yeah, I'm proud of the technical reports. I think I had five technical or six, five right. uh, technical reports and then 15 book chapters and then uh, uh, over 200 but all that was done with the help of students and uh, my technician. Right. Well, you, know, you it's a team. It has to be a team. It can't be separate. You can't, you know, manage on your own. It's better to work in a team thing. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. Dr. Kirksey, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to interview you, and I hope when you come this spring that I'll have a chance to see you. All right. Okay. Well, thank, Th thank you very much, and we'll see you soon, I hope. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. <clears throat>